prosthetic arms for much of the 20th and 21st century looked like this. While prosthetic legs were running in the Olympics, arms were being left behind. Prosthetics uh, is a quite a challenging product to develop. It's not going to replace or, or, or surpass a human hand. It's a tool, ultimately, and it's there to assist you, and uh, we have to make it extremely functional but easy to use. But since the early 2000s, private companies, governments, and research labs are developing prostheses that are more functional and a lot more advanced than previous designs. Wire talk with Easton LaChapelle, founder and CEO of Unlimited Tomorrow, to understand how he designed, tested, and adopted his prosthetic arm. So what are the options available for those looking for prosthetic arms? The landscape of prosthetic offerings today uh, is, is quite a spectrum. There's very simple passive devices. They look like a hand, but they don't have any type of movement or function beyond just aesthetics or cosmetics. The next here is uh, body powered. So this is the classic kind of hook and claw system. Usually you shrug a shoulder, kind of move your body to be able to close and open claw. And then the next class is quite a wide one. You go into the myoelectric, more robotic class. And then beyond that, you get into the, the research level where these are these brain control devices that universities are developing. So the big question was, how can you design an arm that's functional while also being affordable? Easton started with this design. This is really what started it all. This is the very first robotic hand I made when I was 14. And as you can see, there's a lot of uh, simple household items. It's a lot of Legos and electrical tubing at this point. It's very, very basic. Uh, but this essentially validated that we could use motors and tendons uh, to open and close fingers. Next was this model. I made this back in 2012, and this was really the infancy of the consumer 3D printing world. You know, these were essentially kind of hot glue machines that extruded material, and sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't. Uh, you can see it's a very similar concept where we have these servo motors that essentially pull these tendons, these fishing line. For the increased grip, I, I decided to put these little finger pads, and this was, was far more functional. I could actually pick up things accurately and do a little bit more real life tasks with it. Their next prototype was a little more sci-fi. It used an EEG headset, which measured brain waves, to control the prosthesis. So the next prototype is what I call RoboArm. And uh, this was a lot of the concepts kind of rolled into one here. I found a lot of benefit working with tendon systems compared to other mechanical designs. A lot of other devices on the market use linkages. And so then when we looked at tendons and especially the individual finger joints, essentially we want to eliminate the cognitive bandwidth that someone uh, experiences when using a prosthesis. And an experiment with how do we merge man and machine? Can we tap into the brain without a surgery? Do you know? Can we use external headsets? Or is it best to go into the nerves, the muscles, kind of localized area to be able to control the prosthesis. Their next design went back to the basics, getting rid of the headset and focusing instead on a 3D printed material with a tendon system design. So uh, this is like I'm learning from years of prototyping, bundling it all into a single design here. The socket is the hardest part of a prosthesis and if it doesn't fit right, no one's going to use it. And this was actually a replica for a small girl named Momo. We would send webcams and 3D scanners and Xbox Connects down to her house in Florida to where her mother would scan her residual limb. And then we would generate a socket, which is how the device attaches to the person. And then there's a small uh, band that would read your muscles. And then from there, she's able to open and close the hand, change the grips. And we still utilize today of how can we create these natural feedback loops uh, to the brain. We want to supplement the brain. We don't want to take control or to create a secondary brain. Uh, we, wanna, we wanna tap into exactly how a human arm typically works. This is True Limb. This is our first product we launched in June of 2020. And when you look at this, this is essentially a robotic hand. So each of these fingers uh, have individual finger motion. You can see these small tendons in here. We have about 14 joints that act independent. So how does it work? How can people with missing limbs use their muscles to move the device? It's one thing to read data from the human body, which we do through sensors, but then how do we input data back into the body and into the brain? How do we provide feedback of, are you touching something that's hot or cold? Are you picking up something uh, with delicate touch or are you actually like, really grasping it? It starts here with their feedback system. We wrap the entire limb with, with a, a large array of these sensors and we look for very small, minute changes. We try and go as simple as possible. Right now we use a vibration motor similar to what's in uh, cell phones. Their use of 3D printed materials helps keep costs down, but in the beginning, the 3D printed landscape looked a lot differently than today. 
3D printing has come a long way since I started, uh, back when some of the most simple 3D printers made out of laser cut wood and uh, very simple plastic. It looks incredible, but what we we're finding is that it's very brittle. And so we kept having the pinky break. It's what you're gonna bang everything against on a counter. And we kind of reached the point where like, this is just not gonna work for a prosthetic device. It's just not durable enough. And then so we started looking into what's happening in the landscape of 3D printing. And this is actually where we first started talking with HP. They created this incredible machine um, that prints in full color, but also in a very strong nylon material. Innovations in 3D printing meant stronger materials, which hopefully translates to more resilient devices. So what's next for Unlimited Tomorrow? We are constantly learning, constantly doing research, data collection that, that helps influence the future of the product. And so that's something that's really high on our list is just to continue to expand and just, you know, just make this more and more accessible. And we're looking at uh, forms of exoskeletons and other types of technology uh, to use robotics and a lot of our, our foundational technology to, um, you know, help, help give people, uh, you know, empowerment and accessibility and mobility across the world.